Good morning. Yeah, beat me to it. I mean, I, I got to be honest with you. I, I so look forward to church. I, I just, I do. It's the, it's the highlight of my week. It really is. You know, being with my family is, is awesome. But getting to be with my family and then also with my spiritual family at the same time, nothing beats that. I got I to gotta truly be honest, nothing, nothing beats that. I have a passion to, to be here with all of you. You know, Acts chapter 2, uh, at the very first church that they brought together, Scripture said they, they got to enjoy the favor of one another. And that's truly what we get to do here today. Well, listen, today, uh, the, you see on the back of, your, uh, of the bulletin, the title for the sermon is Doing Family God's Way. And when we get to do family God's way, guess what? It works. <laughs> it truly does. I have some scripture that I, I want to, uh, to show you first before we actually get started in that. Uh, the first one is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And it says this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, what does that mean ultimately? Well, it means that God is the source of all Scripture. And that although man wrote the words, it was by the power and the, and the persuasion of Almighty God that he was able to do so. And it also means that what is written is the infallible and the authoritative Word of God. God worked through man. The Bible is not a result of man's imagination or man's wisdom. Look at 2 Peter 1, 22 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the, by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now listen, any time that God's Word is read aloud or it's read silently, those hearing it as well as those that are reading it will be in some way taught or rebuked or corrected, or trained up. Today's teaching is from Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. It is a letter where Paul refutes the false teaching that they had allowed to creep into their theology, which I'm, I'm really not going to address that part today. But the letter also includes some valuable lessons for living our lives as sold-out members of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3 begins with this teaching training portion of his letter. It starts out with instructions for holy living. Now you realize as Christians, we have a responsibility to live holy lives. It's because we're holy people. Not holy as in what our behavior makes us, but holy is in that's who God says we are. If we relied totally upon our thoughts, our words, and our deeds to define our level, level of holiness, guess what? We, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Hebrews 10.10, 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This means that the blood of Jesus Christ spiritually cleanses us from all unholiness and presents us holy in the sight of our Heavenly Father. The process is amazing. It's supernatural. Isaiah says, without this cleansing by God, in 64, 6, all of us have become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now, with the Lord's cleansing in Colossians 1, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, the sacrifice of Jesus, to present you holy in his sight, to present you holy in God's sight, without blemish and free from accusation. That's self-accusation as well, brothers and sisters. We are holy in the eyes of the only one to whom it matters. Not the neighbor, not, not your friends. No, Almighty God, our Creator. So having been made holy, we are called to live our lifestyles to match our holy position. That was the essence of Mark's two-part sermon on living our lives worthy. That's what he taught so, so awesome about. 
Paul has much to say regarding this, this holy life that we're called to live. In, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, he covers a lot of that. Paul tells us where to set our hearts and minds, obviously on above. He tells us what behaviors we're to rid ourselves of, this sinful earthly nature that we all have. And then what behaviors we're to clothe ourselves in. He tells us what to do to get along with one another and how to bind up our lives with love so that we all are unified, all on the same page as his family. And then Paul goes right in talking about families, how to treat one another within our own family. And that is what you're going to hear preached today. So let's go. Colossians 3, 18 to 21 is the sermon text. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. Now, a dozen years ago or so, there was a, a Christian conference in South Africa. And, and, and there, in accordance to the cultural norm, the women are usually the bosses. Now, at this conference, the husbands were invited to come forward for counseling, and they were asked to divide themselves into two groups. First group was those who felt dominated by their wives, and the other group, those who didn't. Now, the vast majority of the men went off to join the group who felt dominated by their wives. As a matter of fact, when the counselor went to the group of those who, who didn't, he found only one man, and he promptly asked him, are you the only man here who doesn't feel dominated by your wife? And the man said, I don't know, really, he replied. In fact, I'm not sure what this group is. I'm only here because my wife told me to go. <laughs> the ladies are going, we're moving to South Africa. That's... Well, Paul was writing this letter to a city that is in present-day Turkey, pretty far from South Africa. And he was writing in the first century. And it's important for us to understand what was going on there in that first century, the cultural norm of the family at that time, how people were living and conducting their lives in the family. Helps us understand what Paul wrote and why he wrote it. There were societal norms back then, accepted ways of how the family was supposed to operate. And I'm not too sure that Dr. Phil would agree with any of them. We know that the Apostle Paul didn't agree and that's why he addressed these issues, and he addressed them with wives, with husbands, with children and parents. Now, he also addresses some issues with slaves and masters, but that's for another sermon. Now, it's also important to understand that nothing in the Word of God is put there arbitrarily. No biblical author ever said, you know what, that, that sounds pretty good. I, I think I'll, I'll include all of that in Scripture. No. See, our belief is that everything in Scripture is there for a reason. Now, it doesn't mean that we understand everything or we have to be able to explain everything in Scripture. God, I'd be in trouble if, if that were the case. We are of the belief it's there in God's Word for a purpose. Actually, it's there for a twofold purpose. For mankind's good and for God's glory. You know, we exist, brothers and sisters, in the body of Christ. We exist to reflect God, to demonstrate who God is to the world. So then let me ask you, if someone were to watch you and someone were to listen to you live out your life, what picture of the Lord would you be giving them? Paul knew that better than anyone of this reflection that we are to be of God. So he would take what was considered the accepted norm of that time and inject the gospel message into it, showing his readers how an obedient, committed Christ follower would compare in comparison to the rest of the world. And you know as well as I do that there should be a difference, right? Major difference, especially living our lives today in this country between the so-called society's normal behavior and the lifestyle in which God has called us to live our lives. We say this all the time. If you are not standing out, then you are blending in. And if there is something that we're called not to do as Christians, as Christ followers, that is to blend in. Look at Leviticus 20, 26. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart. I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. You know, one thing I love about the Word of God, and that is how timeless it is. 
written in centuries past, yet it no less relevant for our lives today than it was then. You know, heaven and earth will pass away, but God says, my word will never pass away. This means that if Paul wrote about standards for how Christian families were supposed to live together in A.D. 60, then those standards would continue to hold true for Christian families in A.D. 2016. So here we go. Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And this is usually when, when women roll their eyes and go, here we go. And men are like, they're sitting up a little straighter in their chairs here. And then in Ephesians, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the, pe- for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So the guys are going, looks like Pastor Reed's got some important stuff, honey, for you to listen to today. One thing I do want you to see this morning is how Paul compares this family life with that of the body of Christ. In so many respects, they are one and the same. First thing, the spiritual family has a head, Christ. The biological family has a head, father, husband. Why did God structure it this way? I don't know. He didn't tell me, but I do know this. When followed as he has designed it, it works. Let's go first to the word submit. Submit. What does it mean? It's important to understand the meaning of the word if, if we're called to do it, right? I mentioned last week that when, when I was preaching on contentment, that in order to learn and understand God's definitions and concepts that he gives us, one thing we're going to have to do, and we're going to have to forget about and kind of erase what we've learned from the world as what its definitions and concepts of the same thing truly is, because most often they are not one and the same. Okay, submit in the Greek. Hupatasso, and it means to place under. It also means to yield to. Now, what is of the utmost importance here is that this placing under, this yielding to, is by choice. It is not compulsion. The man does not place his wife under his leadership. The wife offers to do so freely. It should never be by command, ever. Husbands aren't to command their wives to do anything ever. Now, in ancient times, marriage contracts would advocate the husband to make his wife submit with absolute obedience. And this was the reason that Paul wrote this passage of Scripture, to refute the way of thinking that was, that was ever present for those in the body of Christ. Society may say this is okay, but God says, no, it's not okay. The world says you should do it this way, but the Word says, no, we are to do it this way. See, that's that's why there's been so much rebellion by women. I'm not submitting. I would never yield or give up my rights to my husband. And quite frankly, many of them have done that because, by and large, men, we've screwed it up. The men dropped the ball. The men moved away from God's plan for marriage and moved into their own plan for marriage. And when we move away from God's plan in anything, it never ends well. Okay, so why submit? Why should wives willingly yield themselves to their husbands? Just because God says so? Well, that would be enough of a reason in itself, but no. Wives are to do so because God has designed it that way. Ephesians 5, 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And when followed per God's instructions, guess what? It's for our good and it's for his glory. And when I say our good, I don't mean just for the men's good. I mean for the men and the women and the children. I mean for the family. See, that's God's definition of family. Now, before women cry out, that's not fair, let me get to God's role for the husband. Because I believe if anybody has a a right to gripe about their role, in all honesty, it would be the men. Here's why. Colossians 3.19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, the word harsh is translated picrino, picrino, and it means do not render angry or irritate. 
Do you know how hard it is to be a man? <laughs> and not irritate your wife? <laughs> See, what God mandates for us men is far more difficult than it is. Okay, let me see the hands of any woman whose husband has never even one time irritated you. Ah, see? See what I mean? God's calling us to an impossible task. I'm beginning to understand why Paul never got married. See? <laughs> Here's what he says. In 2 Corinthians, explaining his life to, to us. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, Paul made it through all that, but he didn't think he could make it through being a husband <laughs> in marriage. It shows you exactly how difficult it is to be a godly husband as God has called us. Shipwrecks, stonings, floggings. People hunting us down easier than the role of a husband. All right, that's enough. We'll get back to the scripture and, and do it the right way. Obviously, it's not impossible for either the husband or the wife to fulfill the role as God intended it. But one thing it does do, it takes an incredible amount of work, commitment, and sacrifice on parts of husbands and wives. Let's look at the first part of verse 19. Husbands, love your wives. Okay, I get that. Now, add Paul's directive to the Ephesians as to just how we're supposed to love our wives, the depth to which we are to love them. 525 in Ephesians, husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. In other words, how Jesus loves his body of believers is how we men are called to love our wives. And this next verse will give you an idea of what's involved in that, that level of love. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. See, this relationship between husband and wife is a symbiotic relationship. It's interdependent. Neither role of husband and wife is intended to work independently of the other. God designed the roles to work together in conjunction with one another. So that when the husband is loving, when the husband is sacrificing self, when the husband is caring for his wife, no differently than Jesus himself would be caring for any of his body, the wife is called then to place herself under his love, under his self-sacrifice, and his care. And unless I'm really off the mark, I know of very few godly women who would have a problem yielding themselves to a man who portrays Jesus Christ in everything that he does. You see, submission today is a dirty word because society has perverted its intended meaning. And both men and women in our society have bought into that perversion. Of course, when marriage has been redefined so far differently than God designed it, Nothing is going to work as he has designed it in the family. So in godly reality, truly, ladies, submission is liberating. That's how God intended it. Because it's something you do willingly. You choose to do willingly. And I know the world outside the body of Christ, they're going to roll their eyes when they hear that. But the truth is, they, they don't understand that. They don't possess the ability to accept that or comprehend it. And here's why, 1 Corinthians 2.14. 
The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Men, you need to hear this. And no, it's not too late if you've fallen short or messed up a bunch of times because that's what grace is for. But you do need to begin to take up the responsibility and the privilege of being Christ in your home and to portray him to your wife and to your children. And you're to do it as Christ loved the church. So let's, let's look how Christ loves the church. Christ forgave. You must be willing to forgive, men. Christ never led harshly or critically, and neither should you. Christ protected the church. You are to protect your wife. Christ demonstrated mercy and grace. You must demonstrate to her mercy and grace. Christ empowered the church. You must look to empower your wives. Christ acted without condemnation. You must never condemn. Christ died for the church. You must be willing to die, to surrender yourself, your will, your desires, your wants, all for your wives. See, one of the reasons God placed man in the position of headship within the family, he knew that there were going to be times of disagreements between the two, times when the two couldn't come to an understanding. So in moments such as these, the, the husband is called to take the lead and make the decision per God's direction. The funny thing about that, though, within the husband's decision, he is to consider first what would be best for his wife. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who made himself nothing. He humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And amazingly, when the husband and father sacrifice himself, when he empowers his wife and family, when he takes the spiritual leadership within the family, and when he demonstrates mercy and grace in abundance, and when the family members all respond by yielding themselves to his leadership, the family operation seems to run effectively and efficiently. In the same vein, when the members of the body of Christ, the church, place themselves under the headship of Jesus, when they yield their will to his leadership, when they seek to humble themselves before him, the church operation seems to run effectively and efficiently. So let me ask you, men, do you serve and worship the Lord by choice or under compulsion? Do you come here out of a sense of guilt, thinking that God's going to find a way to punish you if you don't go to church or you don't say your prayers or you don't give your tithe? Do you find yourself living in fear of God more than you do living in his unconditional love? What a horrible way to live your life, if that's the case. Bound up, restricted, anxious, worried, fearful. But men, that's our wives when we foster an environment of compulsion and guilt and fear, lording over our family like a taskmaster would lord it over his slave? Or men, do you come freely by choice out of gratitude and love, praying to God because you have unlimited access to him? Do you come with your tithe willingly? Do you see it as a privilege, knowing that the Lord has forgiven you and that he loves you unconditionally despite your flaws, despite your shortcomings, despite your imperfections? That's, that's how our wives feel when they're living in a home where their husbands empower them, encourage them, esteem them. It's how our wives feel when they have a husband who's willing to love them and serve them despite their flaws, despite their shortcomings and imperfections. This is the home, men, that we must maintain. And finally, Paul's exhortation was to the children and their parents. 
verses 20 and 21. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. You know, Jewish and Roman children were expected to submit, to submit and, and obey by force or obligation. It was customary for Roman and Jewish fathers and teachers to beat children to teach them to be tough. It rarely has that effect. Most often that abuse results in bitterness. And bitter children are quite often rebellious and disobedient or they withdraw and become emotionally scarred. When God says, children, obey your parents, that is calling for children to have respect for parental authority. But see, here again, when dad is portraying Jesus and demonstrating Christ's character in the home, when he's loving mom unconditionally and doling out mercy and grace, chances of him earning respect from his children and them being obedient to him, see, those rise proportionately. Is it a can't-miss guarantee? Unfortunately, no. But I would take those odds any day over the outcome of parenting, being a parent abusively and parenting with an iron fist. And listen, this is no way dismissive of discipline. Proverbs 13, 24 Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. We discipline and we punish our children because we love them, not because we want to take out some kind of anger on them. See, our love for them says we want them growing up responsible and self-sufficient, giving them the best opportunity to succeed. Pastor Nick recently uh, conducted a, a two-evening seminar on parenting. Jeff and Denise Huffman and, and Mark's parents, Dick and Patty Brungard, were the panel of experts. I was able to attend the night in which their children shared what effect their parents had on their lives in, in raising them, which, of course, has led to all five of those children being the productive, God-loving adults and, and spouses and parents that they are today. So I only wish that the room had this many people in it when, when they conducted that because there's much to glean from other people's experiences, their, their mentoring, their ability to do so. Hopefully more later on, we're going to be doing that again. But one common element was heard. Even though Huffman's raised three girls and the Brungards raised two boys. And that is this, that discipline played a major role. See, discipline and punishment were part of both households. Firm, fair, and consistent discipline that was enveloped in love. Proverbs 29, 17. Discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights you desire. Listen, discipline out of love for our children is not embittering or provoking and will not cause discouragement. Why? Because God designed it that way. When a child knows they are loved and is disciplined, might not make it easier or any less light for them or intense for them, but at the end of the day, they know their parents did it out of love. And isn't that our God? You know, we might, as grown children, we might be corrected, we might be disciplined, maybe even rebuked by the Word of God. But at the end of the day, we know that God has done it out of his love, unconditional love for us that is unmatchable. And we know that it's been done for our ultimate good and also for his ultimate glory. Two scriptures I'd, I'd like to end with. And the first one is found in Proverbs. It is Proverbs 3, 11, and 12, and it says this. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, as a father, the son he delights in. And the, and the second one is from Hebrews. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Brothers and sisters, this this is what the Lord is telling us, men. This, this sermon was 
for the family, obviously, but ultimately is for the men, the men. Because he has given us a specific role to be at the head of the family, just as Christ is the head of his church. So what I'm, I'm being led to, I, I, want, I want every adult man, uh, be you a, a, a father or a husband or a stepfather or an adult man that is a spiritual father. Because listen, that's, that's what you are in the body of Christ. You are a spiritual father. I would just like for you to get up and come forward at this time, if you would, please. Alex, you're a spiritual father. Get up here. Mark, you're a spiritual father. You get up here. I cannot tell you how humbled I am right now. Look at these men. This is not common. This is not common in church today because the world has feminized Christianity. I'm just, I'm just so humbled to serve with you men. The strength that is up here, the, the, the physical, yes, but the spiritual strength that is up here at this time can revolutionize our communities, can revolutionize a world when men do this, take the spiritual leadership. And I know, listen, not every one of you guys have, have fulfilled your role as a spiritual leader of the family to a T. So guess what? Get behind me, because neither have I. But we need to work at doing that every single day. The things that I, I read, that, that the way we are to treat our wives, I... I I disgust myself sometimes after I have treated my wife in a way in which I know my Lord would not be proud of me or my family or the things that I say. Men, that's why we have mercy and grace. And that's why God says, you know what? My mercies are new every morning. So you know what? If you didn't do it yesterday, do it today. And then do it again tomorrow. But listen. Look at me, every one of you, every one of you have the opportunity and the privilege to serve him by serving them. Let them see it. Let them hear it. Let them know it. Don't just say it. Don't just believe it. Like I said last week, we got to do it, guys. And there's no better time than starting right now. And some of you that aren't biological fathers, you have a lot of children in this body that you can come alongside of and be a mentor just to demonstrate Christ. That is spiritual leadership. Man, I can't believe how proud I am of you guys. Let's, let's grab, a, grab a hand, grab a shoulder, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Father, just... I am so encouraged, Lord, by, by looking out at this, this sea of men, the sea of fathers, the this, this sea of husbands that will one day, if not today, lead their families. Lord, instill within them the, the understanding of how they are to do that, that they, they take their, their marching orders from the Word of God, not from, not from mankind, not from the world, regardless of what the world says a man is supposed to be. Father, you tell us what a man is supposed to be. Someone who will humble himself before you and serve. Forgive us of the times, Father, when we lorded it over our families. 
Forgive us of the times that we spoke with a sharp tongue. We were quick to rebuke or condemn. That, that our words were sarcastic and not encouraging. Help us to crucify those desires, Lord, of this, of this flesh. And to speak love and to speak encouragement and to be compassionate. Help us, Lord, because we need help. Father, I, I, you have given us all that we need because we know that he who is in us is greater in the, than what this world is telling us to do, what this world's definition of a man truly is. Help us to humble, Lord, ourselves. We come against pride in the name of Jesus and ask that as we, as we depart now, Lord, that we will be intentional that this is a, a rebirth, a starting over for our, our desire to serve you by serving them. Help us. We thank you for our wives, Lord. We thank you for our children, Lord, for what they mean to us, the blessings, Lord, and, and how often we have looked at them not as a blessing. Help us to no longer do that, Father. Help us to see them as you see them, with, with your eyes, Lord your creation, your beautiful, perfect creation. And Lord, how you, you brought our, our spouses together with us to make one complete person. They complete us, Lord. May we, may we let them know that. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let's.